All right, hello everyone and welcome. Um, I'm Daphna Adler, I'm one of the counselors here for those of you who don't know me. Um, and we are here this morning um, for a really exciting session as part of our International University Month webinar series. And students, thanks so much for, for getting up early on your day off today. Um, and I'd like to introduce all of you to our three presenters. Um, and I'm so excited to have them um, with us all the way from the UK. Um, we've got with us Georgina Redbarns from Norwich University of the Arts, which I had the pleasure of visiting last year in February on a um, Counselor University tour, and it was awesome. Um, and then we have also with us Jessica Wrightson from Arts University Bournemouth and Jenny Oxley at Leeds Art University, which I have not visited those two, but I hope to in the future. And you guys You're are always welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys are going to learn um, a whole lot today about studying art and design in the UK. And I encourage you also to check out some of our other um, workshops throughout the month. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Thanks so much, ladies. Thank you, Daphna. Um, yeah, um, so I'm Georgie. I work in the International Office at Norwich University of the Arts. Um, and I've been working there for about three years so far. And uh, I love coming to the US usually. But sadly, obviously, can't at the moment. Um, and yeah, I think that's all for me. I'll just hand over to Jessica. Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Wrightson, and I am at Arts University Bournemouth. Uh, you can tell by my accent, I am not a Brit. I'm actually a transplanted Canadian um, and just thrilled to be able to bridge the connection between my North American roots and the UK education system. Hey, thanks guys. And my name's Jenny and I work in the International Office of Leeds Arts University. So we're more in the north of England. Um, I also love traveling to the US and I do hope that we'll be able to have the opportunity again very soon in the future to come and meet you all in person. So just to quickly run through what we're going to cover today. So first of all, kind of why you're here, why should you study art and design in the UK in the first place and what British art schools have to offer compared to what you could study in the US at a US university. Um, we'll give you a short introduction to our individual universities. So don't worry, we won't give you the full spiel about all our universities, just a short introduction, maybe some of the highlights and we'll maybe talk about a couple of courses which may be a bit more, a bit more niche and a bit more interesting about about our particular universities. We'll also talk about the Art Foundation course. I don't know how much you guys know about this, um, but we'll just give you a short introduction to this. It's not something that's essential for US students, but it is something else that you might want to consider. Um, then some advice about your portfolio, what you might like to include, what um, you would not want to include, and uh, how to prepare a portfolio for an application to a UK university, and then where you can go to find out more. So first of all, first off, why should you even consider the UK as a study destination for your arts degree? And the main thing that springs to mind is the history and the heritage and culture of the UK. So it really is um, one of our USPs, really, a selling point when it comes to an art and design degree. So just imagine the exports that come out of the UK when you think about art and you think about design. And I asked everyone in my office to do a bit of a brainstorm and name kind of British musicians, performers, artists, sculptors, designers, photographers, film directors and creators. Um, and there was just too much really to include in one slide. So I had to kind of narrow it down um, and tried to divide it into categories. So of course, when you think of fashion, then first of all, who comes to mind when you think about British fashion? And it has to be Vivian Westwood, the kind of queen of British fashion who seems to have been around forever. Then of course, Stella McCartney coming from the kind of dynasty that she does come from. Um, Alexander McQueen, and of course, some of you might have heard of Sarah Burton, who of course is very famous for designing the wedding dress of Kate Middleton when she married Prince William. So just to name a few fashion designers. Um, artists, I have to say I was slightly biased when I, I picked my artists for this slide because these are all alumni of our university. So I'm sure you've heard of Damien Hirst, you know, with his crystal skull. Henry Moore, who um, is a, a famous sculptor and he now has the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which is right outside Leeds. Um, film, of course, you know, just to name a few that you might have heard of, Danny Boyle, who of course, um, train spotting. And he was also responsible for being creative director of the opening ceremony of the 2012 London Olympics, which made a massive impact. 
Um, and then when it comes to music, of course, I've tried to pick a few from, uh, from different areas as well. So, I mean, really, this is just to name a few of the UK's exports um, and just to give you an idea of the history and culture, the legacy of UK art and design. Um, moving on to jobs in the UK and what the UK art and design industry means to the UK, it is the fastest growing industry in the UK, the fastest growing industrial sector, and it is worth 111 billion to the UK economy each year. Can I have the next slide, please, Jessica? Um, so really, and then this slide, I think, is just to give you an indication of the gross value added. So you can see there the creative industries, 60% gross value added to the UK economy per year. And just to give you a breakdown of the industries by sector, so you can see software and games is really enormous, but also film and TV, which of course covers photography as well. And advertising, so of course marketing is one of the most important sectors as well, which of course is always very relevant to the creative industries. Next slide, please, Jessica. And I think again, just to industry as well, um, just to illustrate, then STEM jobs always have that reputation of being a good career choice, a steady career choice, but really this just illustrates more than anything the growth of the occupations within the creative industries more than anything. And also the creative industries are future proof. So if you think of some traditional industries, so for example, accountancy, you could think that's a steady job, that's a good career choice, but actually accountancy is at one of the highest risks of being automated in the future. So I think in the future businesses will have all of their accounts teams farmed out to, um, to computers. However, when it comes to the creative industries, they are at the least um, risk of being automated in the future because we still need human ingenuity to come up with those creative ideas which drive the creative industries. Okay, um, thanks, Jenny. Um, just to briefly um, cover this because it's something that's very new. Um, we're talking about all these different jobs and careers that you could get. And actually this is more relevant than ever because um, from, uh, from summer 2021, when you graduate from uh, your degree in the UK, you can apply for the graduate route, which is a new route, which means that you can stay in the UK um, for two years after you've completed your undergraduate or postgraduate degree and it means that you can look for work during that time um, or find work and it's going to make it a lot simpler than it than it has been so far for people when they graduate so it means that the prospect of starting your career in the UK once you graduate is a, a very much a real thing um, so looking at the kind of jobs that are available um, and in which sectors are available in the UK is definitely something that you can really put into your research when you're looking at, at university. So that's quite exciting. All right, next slide. So now we've talked a little bit about uh, the career prospects in our industry in the UK, but let's talk a little bit about why you might consider studying a creative degree in the United Kingdom. Well, one of the advantages right off the bat is it's possible to complete your bachelor's degree in as little as three years. In the United Kingdom, we have a three-year bachelor degree system. Well, most of the countries in the United Kingdom, I should say. Uh, and it is still a full bachelor's degree. It will be recognized by employers. It will be recognized by graduate schools. It holds the same status as a, a four-year degree would in North America. The other advantage is the broad range of practical subjects that we offer. If you think about it, um, the UK it has a long history of excellence across all of the creative disciplines. Um, it's the home of Shakespeare, and you can go back years and years and find this. And this is what we have built our university on, is this tradition. So you're going to find a range of subjects. And I promise you, we will offer at our university some degrees you've never even heard of or thought of as an option for you. So taking the time to investigate those options will give you a broad range of alternatives for your studies. For me, one of the exciting things about a degree in the creative sector in the UK is that it is a deep dive into your subject. So those of us that know the American style of university degrees, you normally have your major and you'll have your minor and there'll be some elective subjects and maybe some core requirements. And the North American model is really 
predicated on this broad-based learning system. And there are a lot of advantages to the system. It's wonderful. But if you are passionate about your subject, if you love your art, then the opportunity to spend virtually all of your time immersing yourself in the discipline is one of the main advantages we offer at our UK universities. So that's something to think about. What do I see for myself? How much time? How many different disciplines do I want to put my fingers in? And what system is going to be best for me? We, of course, offer the opportunity to study with creative professionals from around the world. Uh, we're very proud that the UK continues to draw professionals who want to teach and share their disciplines with you. And we maintain strong connections with industry. This is central to all of our universities and all of our degrees is ensuring you build those relationships. And of course, the UK is known as a multicultural and multinational environment. So you will have the experience of learning and studying with people from all over the world. The teaching and learning style is worth talking about in a little bit more detail. Uh, when we come out of high school, we're very used to this traditional classroom style learning. Uh, we, we go to our classes, there may be some discussion, we have our assignments, we write our exams. Uh, there may be some project work thrown in. But the university style, especially related to the creative industries, is very studio-based. It's hands-on, it's practical. So the vast majority of our students do not spend a lot of time sitting in a classroom listening to a lecture, but they spend it engaged in their practice. So the teaching staff, the support staff are there to ensure that you have the tools and the techniques and the guidance to be successful, but it is very much self-driven. So there will be workshops, seminars, the odd lecture thrown in, but the lectures can be exceptional. You have guest lecturers who come from industry, who are practicing professionals perhaps alumni of the university. You do a lot of student critiques where you gather with your classmates and you discuss your projects together. And that's an opportunity to learn from your classmates, which is really valuable. We, of course, all offer the opportunity for work experience and perhaps a study abroad semester to include another country in your international experience. And public exhibitions and shows are a very significant part of all of our a university experience. It's the chance to show your work to the public and also to your industry. And many of our universities will take the student graduates and have them participate in the industry shows, industry conferences, where you can again continue to build your network. So collaboration is um, a big part of what we do. I think this is uh, something that you grow as an artist is by building your connections and drawing from the people around you. So in your degree, you will work with your classmates. Somebody might have a slightly different skill set or a slightly different expertise, and you will work together to achieve your goals. But then we also encourage the collaboration across the different courses. So you might be a graphic designer and you might work with a photographer. You might be a costume maker and work with film production. You might be an actor and uh, work with fashion. So many different collaboration opportunities. And the goal here is to mimic the work world. So when we go out into the workforce, we very rarely work in a vacuum completely by ourselves. We will work with others and draw on their experience and their skills. And we're going to create that environment for you at the university. Okay, so as well as um, being in a very collaborative environment, which is very exciting, you're going to be surrounded by some amazing specialist facilities. So all of our universities are entirely set up, dedicating themselves to art and design. So that means basically every building you walk into is going to have something pretty cool in it. Um, it means that you're going to have access to dedicated workshops for your subject major. You're also going to have access to industry standard software and that's super important because you've got to basically learn on the same stuff that you're going to use when you go and get a job um, so it's cutting edge um, and we have to think about not just what industry is using right now but we've got to think ahead so in about three years time when you graduate if you're learning to use a specific software is this what uh, industry is going to be using so that you're ahead of the curve um, it also means that you'll have access to really high tech equipment. So if you're doing a photography course, for example, you're going to be using really high tech camera equipment that's worth up to, say, 
£10,000 for a camera that you get to use for free. You're going to have access to lighting and rigging systems that they would use and real film sets um, so that you are used to handling um, very specialist equipment. Um, you're also going to have access to specific studio space for your subject um, so that you feel really part of a community and you feel like a proper maker, which, which is what you are becoming. Um, so all of this gives you access to some really specialist materials. Um, it means that you can explore some very traditional ways of making. So one of the things you might find at our university is copper plate printing, um, and that's been around for centuries. But then you'll also find very high tech UV printers as well. So you're going to have the full range of different kinds of technology that you can explore. So it's really quite exciting to have that all at your fingertips. Um, but as well as having the physical um, facilities, it's important that you actually learn how to use it properly. So you can expect to learn from um, technicians that are really amazing at using their specific technology and learning from them and actually being able to have them on hand to help you um, to make as well. So as well as your lecturers, um, your technicians can play a really important role as well. So next slide. So this is the great thing about being at um, an arts uh, school is that your, your teachers, the people that surround you are also going to be practitioners. So that means that they are making as well. They're going to be artists, designers. You might be learning from someone who's worked as a film director or a producer. If you're doing animation, you can expect that the people that you're learning from might have a specialism in stop motion or they might have a career from games design. And that means that they can totally to relate to you um, in that they know what it's like to actually try and put out work into the world. And they also have those connections to industry that they bring. So they have their own networks that they bring to you. Um, that means that they can bring in um, visiting professionals, people working within their industry um, to talk to you. Um, and potentially to give you um, opportunities for internships um, or even work after you graduate. Um, so that's something that, again, can expose you to different kinds of jobs that you would never even have thought of until you went to university. Next slide. So moving on now to after you graduate. So every UK university has a careers and employability team. And this is one of the, the most important thing that the UK government measures UK universities on. So how well do they prepare their students for life after university? So it really is a very important part of life in a UK university. So your careers team will be in touch with you right from the start. It's not just something that you think about in your final year. The employability is built into the course all the way through. So your careers and employability team are there to help you with things like advice. So how to build your resume. And um, if you want to go freelance after you graduate, for example, maybe you've studied graphic design and you want to start your own graphic design agency or become a freelance illustrator. They'll teach you about how to do this. Um, and lots of it is actually built into the course as you go through as well. So it's the business side of being an artist and a designer, as well as um, the creative side. So for example, how to pitch to your clients, how to invoice your clients, um, how to um, kind of market yourself and advertise what you can do. Um, so the careers team will help you with this. Um, how they do this is that we have uh, guidance counsellors who you can have one-to-one -one meetings with. Um, we run lots of events all the way through, so careers fairs, which are, of course in normal times we have lots of uh, companies visiting the university. We run big events, so for example, um, just to give you an example from our university, at the, um, but the other universities will have this as well, at the end of the academic year we have a big end of year show where all of the students get to show um, their work and then the entire campus is turned into a big um, exhibition. And on our big opening night we invite lots of industry professionals to come and see the students' work. So you can create lots of contacts that way. 
and we have summer schools as well which run all throughout the summer and then there's lots of different workshops that, uh, that run throughout the entire year and uh, to go back to what Jessica was saying right to start um, employability is built into the course so it's all studio based you work from live briefs so it's as if you are working in the industry right from the start how to respond to a brief and being based in the studio as if you are based in an agency and um, we have visiting professionals who come in to talk about their life, their work, their career, and how they got started. And um, all of our staff are practicing professionals in their own field as well. So they have those contacts um, and they can set you up with work experience as you go through the course. Um, the creative industries are well known for their transferable skills and the careers office are there to help you build this into your resume and, and promote that. So for example, an arts degree can give you skills such as um, self-motivation, the communication skills, um, how to develop your individual ideas, but also work well within a team, because as Jess was saying, it's, it's all about collaboration and you're never going to work in isolation when you're actually working as a professional. Um, and also don't forget the observational skills, the research skills and the analytical skills that go into how to respond to a brief in the first place. So I think the careers team is there to emphasize it, but it's definitely um, an arts degree is no longer the kind of low vocational degree that it had the reputation for being in the past. The kind of myth for the, the uh, starving artist is definitely no longer relevant. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, and something else as well, which is very important. So of course you go to university to achieve a degree and to learn a degree, but it is also a life experience. And a big part of that is the student experience. So one part of that is how we support you all the way through your degree, um, but also the clubs and societies and the extracurricular activities that a UK university can offer. So alongside your degree, you might want to get a part-time job, which of course in the UK, um, you are able to do on a student visa, but you also want to join lots of clubs and societies and to really get the most out of a UK student university experience as you possibly can. So of course, not only does this broaden your interests and complement your CV, but it really does improve your resume and also um, it will really help with your mental health and uh, making new friends as well. So um, a UK university, we have um, clubs and societies from you know, sports societies and kind of um, societies relevant to your degree. We have international student societies, but then we also have really silly societies as well. For example, like the, the cheese eating society and the Harry Potter appreciation society. So whatever your kind of weird and wonderful interests are, there will be a club and society for you. So the best advice really is just to kind of throw yourself into it and get as well involved in as much as possible. Once. Thanks, Jenny. We also have a Harry Potter Society. I wonder if every university does. I think everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think some of our buildings actually look quite Harry Potter-like, so um, it's, not, it's not hard to imagine yourself in Harry Potter. Um, yeah, so just to, we're now just going to talk individually about each of our institutions to give you a brief overview of, of what we're all about. So, um, Norwich University of the Arts is in the east of England. So on this uh, yellow map that you can see here, uh, it's right in that corner where the N is. Um, so it's kind of middle of uh, the country, but in the far um, east of the country. Uh, it's about uh, an hour and a half from London, which I love talking to American students because you guys are so used to massive distances. So for you guys, it's like popping down the shops. Um, so uh, it takes you yeah, about an hour and a half on the train. So not far away, but it's a very unique uh, city. So our university ha was founded in 1845, um, originally as like a fine arts school, and we still use the original building for, for fine arts. Um, we're pretty small. We have 2,300 students all together, and that includes our postgraduate students. So it's quite a, a small uh, community where you can get to know people really easily. Um, we are rated TEF Gold, and this is this is a government rating that looks at teaching excellence and the outcomes from degrees. Um, we uh, were, were University of the Year this year um, when it comes to student retention. When we talk about student retention, that refers to completion rates. So 96% of the students who started their degree finish their degree on time. Um, students have voted us top five in the UK for our facilities. Um, we have a respectable graduate employment rate of 93%. Um, 
Um, and we are one of the safest cities uh, in the UK, Norwich. Our university is based um, right in the center of the city and you can walk everywhere within it. Um, and they are a range of different buildings that have been renovated. So this lovely building on the top right here is the architecture building. So that used to be a Victorian school and that was all renovated. And down in the basement, you'll find the film studio. So they look really old from the outside, but they're super new and have amazing facilities um, inside. Um, and at the bottom here, I've listed the kind of main uh, subject area majors that we offer. Um, so this isn't a full list of the courses, but it's the kind of subjects that you could consider um, studying at our university. So they range from, you know, very traditional things that you would expect to find to um, much more modern things like UX design, which is user experience design, dealing with new technologies, um, things like film, fashion, interior design, you could go into visual effects, all sorts. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of courses. So if Jessica, you could go to the next slide, um, just to bring a couple to your attention. So obviously you would expect us to offer something like fine art. What makes it a little bit different, I think, is because you actually um, would have workshops in your first year across uh, quite a variety of disciplines. So I know that sometimes uh, if you go to an American art school, you might have to be quite specific and decide straight away that you might want to just study sculpture, for example. Um, but actually, uh, your first year on fine art, you would cover sculpture, painting, printing, video installation, and performance art. Um, so it means that maybe you would try um, stuff that you hadn't necessarily done before. Um, actually, we have a, a great US student studying fine art with us right now called Gillian. And she was super into painting before she joined. And now she doesn't do any painting. She's absolutely in love with sculpture. Um, and that's thanks to an amazing uh, sculpture artist who, who works with us, who's just made her so inspired. Um, so she's completely changed her outlook on what she wants to do. It's quite exciting. Um, another great thing about the fine art course is you get your own um, space within the fine art studio. So that is the original studio from 1845 where people have been making art for hundreds of years. Um, and you have that throughout the year that's just for you. Um, there's no in-house style, so that means you'll never be forced to do a kind of art that you don't believe in or doesn't feel comfortable to you you have really open briefs and how you actually address that brief is really up to you. So we really want you to find your own style and your own practice. That's really important to us. There are lots of um, opportunities to exhibit both regionally and nationally. And we're quite lucky because although Norwich is quite a small place, it has a lot of independent uh, smaller galleries and we have really good relationships with those galleries. So you can actually put on your own private exhibitions, even from your first year. Um, and working on those is really important way for you to get real experience about curating work, about actually promoting a show, right down to like carrying out the health and safety assessment before you can actually let the public in. But they're also go nationally as well. So we have um, associations with other um, artist collectives and galleries in Cambridge and in London. There's some exciting residency opportunities, including an opportunity once you graduate to work with Anthony Gormley, who has his home in North Norfolk, which is very, very exciting. Um, and students enter a lot of national competitions. They've won a lot of awards nationally for, for their work. So that's another way for you to, to get your name out there. And just to highlight games, art and design, this is a pretty cool uh, course to, do, to study. It's one of our biggest courses. Um, so again, you kind of look at three different areas of game design. Um, so that's concept art, asset production and indie development. But between those three, it means that you're capable of designing and making a game from start to finish and actually making that game function really well. But you can specialize in one of those areas if you want to. Uh, you also learn to carry out art tests and these are used by industry, by the kind of AAA producers to actually select uh, people for jobs. So it's really important that you learn how to, to do a lot of art tests. Um, we've actually been voted by the rookies as the one of the top 10 schools in the world for games. And Tiger, which is um, the European um, 
industry group uh, named us the best educational institution. Um, we work with PlayStation first. Um, we also take part in several games festivals uh, every year. And we have alumni that are working for some of the big AAA producers, um, for example, working on um, Red Dead Rebellion, I think it's called, um, and all sorts of um, different AAA uh, games producers, but also students who've actually come out with a game that's gone straight out to market, including um, one that's gone on Nintendo Switch and another that's gone on PlayStation VR. So you can actually launch your career straight out of the course, which is super exciting. Okay, it's enough from me. It's my turn to talk about Arts University <laughs> more than that. Now, I, I think for some students who are listening, it, it can get a little difficult to differentiate between uh, the institutions. And, and we do acknowledge that, that there's a lot of overlap. Um, and, and that's actually a good thing. Uh, it means that we're all working to a very high standard. But I also think that there are some nuances in, in what we do and who we are. And so it's really about you finding your fit. So throughout the session, uh, when it sounds like we're repeating ourselves a little bit, just really look for those little nuggets and those little differences, and that will help with your research. Arts University Bournemouth was established in 1885. Again, we weren't uh, a university at that time, but we have always had the arts and creative practice um, as our foundation. We are a small university by most standards, but I think by specialist institutions, we're on the slightly larger side. We're about 3,700 students from over 55 different countries. And everything is on the one campus. And you will find that it's quite common in the UK that universities do have multiple campuses. And so that's something certainly to factor into your research. Uh, we're very uh, happy that all of our students are on the one campus. So again, that collaboration is very organic. It just happens because everyone is working and living in the same environment. We're very proud of the fact that we were named first place for career prospects for art, fashion and textiles, and for film production and photography in the Guardian newspaper last year. And of course, we also have the Teaching Excellence Framework Gold Award, a testament to the quality of the teaching. And you will find this in a number of UK universities. And it's just that little nod to the quality of the teachers that work at our institutions, that you can feel confident knowing that these people have your best interest at heart. Uh, we were recently named the top specialist art and design university by the Sunday Times Good University Guide um, for 2021. So we're very pleased with that. And I just want to talk for a second about the image, uh, the blue building there on the right hand side of my slide. This is our drawing studio. It was designed by architect Sir Peter Cook who is an AUB uh, alumni, and it is an exceptional space, the first drawing studio to be built in the United Kingdom in the last hundred years. And now you might think, well, uh, a drawing studio, what's so special about that? Uh, this space is phenomenal. That window that you see there with the light faces north, so it gives exceptional light for working inside the studio space. Um, it also isn't just for drawing. The space actually has no shadows. Uh, it's all curves inside, and so it is exceptional for photography, uh, for drawing. Our dancers also use it. The actors use it. So it's a wonderful common space that it just allows for practice and for inspiration. And I'm going to highlight a couple of our exceptional courses. Again, we offer a broad range of different um, opportunities for study, but ones that are particularly popular uh, our costume and our film costume and uh, production design. I'm cheating a little bit because I put two here in the same category, but in fact, they were just split into two different degrees. Uh, our costume work is exceptional. We were awarded the Queen's Anniversary Prize for Distinguished Degree Level Education in Costume Design. So we have this wonderful photo of our course leader meeting the Queen to accept this prize. Um, and it just is an acknowledgement of the high caliber of work. Uh, it is grounded in historical costume, but it isn't only historical costume. And they do the making and they do the designing of costumes. And then they also do what's called production design, which might be sets for theater or backgrounds for, um, for screen productions. So you get all of that through these two degrees. But again, you get access to the equipment and to the garments and to the technology that you need to learn this discipline. 
And the result is working with our acting students, working with our film production students, working with our photography students to bring these pieces to life. And another one I love talking about is our degree in model making. We are one of only a small handful of universities in the world that offer a full degree in model making. And many of you probably haven't heard of it, but in fact, model makers exist in all disciplines. These are the people who make the models. They might do so in the manufacturing industry. Anything that will be manufactured will have a model made of it before it goes into full production. They work with architects to bring the designs into 3D and they will build the scale models of the buildings designed by our architects. Uh, they work in film and television, building props, uh, doing prosthetics. Um, and they also will work with design firms, again, to bring the ideas to life so that they can be measured and, um, and evaluated for success. So the model making student is really someone who loves to work with their hands. They love 3D work. They're passionate about the building but they also have an eye for detail. And this is so critical. Um, if you look at the little model of my lovely little um, monkey chimpanzee there, that is a model made by one of our students and it is as real to life as it possibly could be. This is what our model makers do. And so the eye for detail, the, the collaboration and the desire to build are what make a model maker successful. And I will tell you that model making is one of our courses that has almost 100% employment rate because there is such demand for people with these skills. And now on to Leeds Arts University. So we are the only specialist arts university in the north of England. And um, similar to how Georgie showed you a map of the UK, if you looked at a map of the UK, we would be about halfway up. Um, so we're in the north of England, it's probably about two hours north of London and about two hours south of Edinburgh. Um, we are again quite a small university, we have around 2,000 undergraduate students and we have 700 students studying at the foundation level and I'll tell you a little bit more about our foundation course later. And Leeds is an exciting and rapidly growing city with a thriving art scene. It's got a thriving music scene and lots going on. It's also a very young city. So we have five universities all together here in Leeds, um, which equals about 125,000 students. So there's definitely um, a lot going on. It's uh, well known for its shopping and its nightlife as well. Um, and this is probably why we were voted the, voted the UK's best student city um, by the independent newspaper that was voted for by the students themselves. Um, I know this was all the way back in 2016, but I'm going to keep quoting that um, for as long as I work here. So we are the UK's best student city. And uh, we're also the winner of the 2020 What You The Student Awards for Student Support in 2020, which we were really proud of. And we came a runner up for university with the best facilities. But I want to mention that in particular as well, because we actually won the Student um, Facilities Award in 2016, 2018 and 2019. So just, again, that's something I'm going to quote for as long as I work here. And we are top five in the UK for student satisfaction. And we also had 22 million pounds worth of investment completed in our campus in 2019. So that included a brand new auditorium, new photography studios, state-of-the-art um, music workshops, music production suite, um, and film studios as well. So, um, and again, we are all based on one campus in the city centre of Leeds. And a couple of the courses that I wanted to highlight that we are particularly known for, they are both relatively new courses, but they've both proved to be exceptionally popular and with American students as well. So one is our comic and concept art course. And in the very first year that we ran this course, we had 10 international students on it, which is actually the largest number of international students that we have on any of our courses. And that was in the first year of it running. So it is a very niche course and it grew out of our illustration course because apparently illustration was just a bit too broad for some of our students and we had students on the illustration course that just wanted to uh, specialise even further. So it is a studio based course where you get to discover the theory of practice and professional context of comic and concept art and you are encouraged to apply your specialism across a range of specialisms so for example character environment architecture vehicle and creature design 
and you do develop specialist skills which can be applied to a range of creative careers. So just to give you an example, the film and the game industries to comic art and graphic novels. And this course as well, out of this undergraduate course, has now grown two even more niche postgraduate courses. So we have the MA in graphic novel and the MA in world building, which again, very niche courses, but very exciting. Um, and then we have the filmmaking course as well, which, as I mentioned, has a brand new state of the art industry standard studio. Um, and again, it's a very hands on course. It's called filmmaking because it is not a film studies course. So you don't, for example, watch a film and then talk about the different techniques and then write an essay on those techniques. You actually then go out and put those techniques into practice and how you would do those techniques yourself. So you can make films on location and all about, all around the city and Yorkshire as well. And Yorkshire is becoming, um, Yorkshire where Leeds is based, sorry, just in case you don't know the geography of the UK. Um, it's actually becoming a bit of a hub for the creative industries. So Channel 4, which is one of the biggest television channels in the UK, has now moved its headquarters to Leeds. And a lot of the film industry are moving their location sets to Leeds and Yorkshire as well, mainly because London and the South East is very expensive to operate in. And of course, we have some amazing scenery and locations here as well. So with the, the filmmaking course you can get involved in all stages of development and production. So in the first year you would be pushed to try out every single aspect of filmmaking. So for example directing, producing, if you want to be the lighting, the technical person, if you want to do sound, editing or post-production, then you get push to try out all of those different areas and then as you went through the course in second and third year you specialised further and that's up to you, it's up to you, the, you as the individual student to choose where you would like to specialise further into what aspect of filmmaking that you would like to, uh, to concentrate on. And um, all of our courses do involve an international aspect as well. So for example, the filmmaking course um, in a normal year, they would visit the Berlin Film Festival as well, just to give you that international aspect and that hands-on experience. And also, we just wanted to highlight the Foundation Diploma in Art and Design, which is something that all UK arts universities do offer, but sometimes in different formats. So, for example, we offer it as a standalone course, but if you went to Norwich University of the Arts, it's often a built-in year, so it would be year zero. Um, of a three-year course, which would then make the course four years overall. Um, sorry, Jess, I'm not quite sure how it is at um, AEB. Um, but in the UK, then um, an art foundation course is not required for students with US qualifications. So you could actually go straight from high school to degree level study. But a lot of students, and this includes UK students, so I did mention we have 700 students studying our foundation course at the moment, um, and only around um, 40 of them are international. Um, so a lot of UK students do feel that they need that extra year in order to explore and to develop their practice before they choose where to specialise at degree level. So the idea of a foundation course is that it just gives you that extra opportunity to explore lots of different specialisms before you choose where to focus. Because of course when you choose your degree path, that is then three years of intensive study in one specialism. Whereas the foundation course gives you that extra time to develop and to try out different specialisms before you choose where to focus. So overall it would make your study four years, but we just wanted to highlight that opportunity as well, because it is sometimes useful for students who feel maybe they need an extra bit of time to develop, but um, it also could just be that you want to try out lots of different specialisms as well before you decide where to focus at degree level. Okay, thanks Jenny. Um, on now to portfolio preparation. So if you are thinking seriously that you want to go to art school, then inevitably you're going to have to start thinking um, at some point about how you're going to make up your um, art and design um, portfolio so that you can apply to your course. Um, so I'm just going to give you some kind of general points about what um, art schools are really looking for. Um, and some of this is probably the same for US art schools, but um, some of it might be a little bit different. Um, so generally, what are universities looking for from the portfolio? Um, it's really there for us to see your technical ability. So how do you create and, and what kind of level is, is your technical ability? Um, really important though is ideas development. So it's showing that creative journey that you go on um, from your initial idea to your outcome. 
and also being able to see um, what or who inspires your work, where are you getting your ideas from. Um, so a good uh, portfolio should cover all of those areas. Um, in terms of uh, the format of your portfolio, um, I would say that generally uh, universities are looking for about 15 and no more than 20 images. And that includes images of work in progress. So for example, if you want to take um, pictures of your sketchbooks, um, actually on the top right here is, is an example of a way that you could show the development of an idea. Um, this is actually part of a process for creating a short animation, but the student has shown how they have taken um, something from a photograph and then done an initial sketch and then added colour to that sketch and actually progresses all the way through. So being able to show how you're developing that piece um, is really, really important. Um, also, just thinking about how you're labelling your work. You don't have to write loads on, on your portfolio. It should really speak for itself. But it's important to label um, what the project is um, or what that particular piece is referring to just to help people understand your work. Um, something that's quite good to do potentially is to show somebody who's never seen your work before. So I don't know if you might have an uncle or something in your family and when you think your portfolio is really good, if they don't understand what they're looking at um, in terms of what they should be looking at, then it might be an indication that you might want to rework the order of some of your work or think about adding a few more labels um, to your work. Think about obviously when you do photograph your work, making sure that it's really good quality or scanning, uh, scanning your work, making sure it's good quality because otherwise it will let down um, the actual piece that we're looking at because obviously it's probably not going to be possible for you to fly to the UK and bring us your portfolio so you'd, you'd be providing this digitally. Um, we're not prescriptive about the way that you actually um, provide your work in a digital format um, but we recommend a few different sites like Behance or Tumblr because they're more visual um, but you could always just create a PDF and then upload it to a to a site like um, Dropbox, for example, but I mean, Dropbox itself is not very pretty to look at, so it's probably not a great place um, if you want to just put loads of files there. I wouldn't do that. Um, and obviously, you've got loads of free um, uh, software like YouTube and Vimeo if you are including uh, video work in there as well. If you are looking to do a performing arts course, then no doubt you'll probably have to prepare an audition. Um, that could be, for example, two recorded monologues and you might want to think about how the pieces that you choose reflect your own interests or you might be prescribed pieces, but quite often universities will leave that open to you. Um, you might have a, an interview over Skype or something similar or Zoom um, and you might also take part in a directed audition. So that might be reworking one of your monologues in a different style. Um, so they're just something to bear in mind. Next slide. So what can you do now? So maybe you're in your junior year or maybe you're like way off of going um, into the university, but you want to start thinking about how you can start preparing that portfolio now. These are just some kind of general tips is it helps to make sure you get into the habit of documenting your process. And that can be easier said than done because Quite often you might get excited about an idea and just jump straight in um, and work really, really hard on getting that final outcome. But it's important to try and remember to take photographs or keep those sketches that you made along the way um, because that could really help you um, become one of your projects that goes in your final portfolio. This is also a great time for you to just experiment, not just in class, but outside of class. Um, experiment with the materials you use, with the processes you use, take risks because even if it's a complete disaster, you'll learn stuff from it and you will be less afraid um, of taking risks and that's something that you will be expected to do at university is to step out of your comfort zone. So the more you can do that in your own time, um, the better, better off you're going to be in the end. Um, I'd also say take whatever opportunities you can to create. So whether there's uh, like a society that's looking for you um, to redesign 
their logo or their t-shirt, if there's a fashion show that's going to take place, if there's a stage production that you could help out with, then get involved because you can also discover new things that you're interested in. Um, and it also could give you some really valuable work that you could include in your portfolio. Really also the best thing you could do is just research your course of interest. And that could be as simple as, for example, I know all of our universities now have our degree shows from this year online. So you can actually look at all the work of our graduates this year and you can have a look at the work that they made and that might give you some really good inspiration um, and help you think about what you might want to do in the future and just generally when you're going out and about um, you might want to get into the habit of having a sketchbook with you or just taking photographs on on your phone of things that you see about just learning to be observant of the world around you um, you never know where those ideas are going to spark from so i think that's it from me Oh yes, no, still me. <laughs> so um, if that is all sparking your interest and you want to learn a bit more, um, we are going to all be attending the upcoming NACAC virtual college fairs. Um, I know um, I and Jenny are going to be at the one on October the 18th, but I think actually Jessica is going to be um, at one earlier on, aren't you, Jessica? I can't remember the date. No, it was actually the November 8th one. November yeah, 8th. Last okay. night, I was online last night, and then the November 8th. <laughs> November 8th. So a look out for the uh, NACAC Virtual College Fairs, um, and you can chat to us during those if you want to. Um, you can also sign up for virtual open days. So all of us are offering online live uh, virtual open days which you can sign up for and often even if the timing doesn't work for you it is worth signing up because you can usually get recordings of those um, so you can watch them back in your own time but that's a really good way because you'll hear directly from the people that teach on the course about their subject you also get to hear from the students as well so you won't just have to listen to people like us you can listen to people who are really doing it um, alternatively if you don't like that sort of thing and you want to just do things in your own time all of our websites um, have the uh, ability for you to send a direct message to students currently studying and you just do that on the website it'll pop up if you want to talk to someone from the us i think we've all got people from the us available for you to chat to uh, or if you want to just talk to someone who's doing a course that you're interested in you just send them a message they are real students and they will just answer you um, honestly what their opinions are. So that's a really good way for you to find out directly from them. Okay, next slide. So finally, this, these are our contact details. So if you do wanna send us an email, then please, please do send us an email um, or just pop onto our website. You'll see there's a kind of standard format for UK universities, which is that uh, the internet address always ends.ac.uk. So you can always just Google us, um, but that tends to be how um, how you'll see them. But it was really, really good to have the opportunity for us all to chat to you today. Um, and if you do want to ask, ask any questions, we're just going to hang on for a bit. So if you want to put that in the chat, um, then we'd be very happy to answer any questions you've got. Okay, I think uh, I'm just going to hang on here, Daphna, until, and see if anyone wants to ask us questions. Yeah. There's got to be some questions. Um, okay. Oh, here's one. Okay. Could you tell us more about the cost? That's a great question. That is a good question. Uh, well, I mean, I'm happy to go first. I mean, um, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Usually, uh, students from the US are. Um, if you're looking at out of state uh, art schools in the US, you are just going to be so excited when you hear about the fees in the UK because, uh, well, first of all, if you go in the three year option, you're going to be saving 25% because you don't have four years, you have three years. Um, but generally, most UK degrees are going to cost for international students somewhere between 15,000 and um, 25,000 US dollars a year. And that's the international fee. Um, most universities as well, I think all will offer some kind of scholarship uh, reduction you will find that that scholarship reduction tends to be much less than in the US because our fees are lower to begin with. So there's not a huge amount of discounting that goes on. 
but you can also apply for federal aid loans um, to study overseas. So you can, co you can cover the full cost of attendance, not, not just your tuition, but also uh, your food, your residence. You can, um, you can get student loans to cover that as well. Um, does anyone want to add to that? I think, um, yeah, I would just add to that as well. So what Georgie mentioned was the, the tuition fees, which, um, as she said, you know, are lower because it is a shorter degree and um, because you get it done in um, more time and our fees are lower to start with. But um, we're all um, approved to administer federal aid. So on our websites, you'll find a full cost of attendance, which would break it down by tuition fees, but also kind of expected living expenses as well. So within the cost of attendance is basically every cost that you could reasonably expect to incur for a year's study in the UK. And something else to think about as well is, of course, I would say this because my university is based in the north of the UK, but the north of the UK does tend to have a lower cost of living than the south of the UK. Um, and none of us are based in London, but of course, if you were thinking of attending a university in London or central London, then you would have to take those costs of living into account as well, because that would be kind of more comparable to deciding to go study in Manhattan. So just uh, take into account the cost of living of, of the local area where the university is based. And the only other thing I would add, and we alluded to it earlier, is the product that we offer as public universities in the UK is actually more comparable to the private art institutes in the US than the big public state schools. And, and so that is where we really come out favorably, is you're going to get the product that you might expect from a private institute, but at the public tuition rates. So we don't sacrifice the quality. Um, I think we come out a little bit ahead because we do have some government support in the operations of our university. And so when you're, when you're comparing your institution, I think we, can, we are more comparable to a private arts institution. Great. Thank you all. And, and I will add to that too. Um, so for the students, it, it's, you know, this isn't really new for you guys. And it's, it's like, naturally you want to like superimpose your understanding of the American system onto um, UK and other countries, right? Because that, that's what you know. And it's really like um, apples and oranges. It is so different in Europe. Um, and in the UK, it's just, it's like how all, all three reps said, it just starts lower. It's just, college just costs a lot less there. Um, and so it, to think about it here, like we just pay such an exorbitant amount of money um, and you can get your full degree over there for about the cost of one to two years of university here. Like think about that, right? Um, and, and you know, if you're studying art, it is so specialized and you just heard some really, really amazing opportunities. So it's a, a really cool option to think about. Um, and as they all said, they will take FAFSA. Um, there are some limitations because some things, um, some uh, grants are only available for US schools. Uh, but there is some money that you could take over with you from American financial aid. Um, and for those of you who want to learn more about this topic, um, I encourage you to come today at 2.30. We have a workshop all about affordability of international study. And we will have a rep from Scotland who will be talking about UK. So you can learn more. Uh, but it is so refreshingly um, affordable compared to college in the US. Really, really super cool. Any other questions? Ah, yes. Okay. How flexible is it for students to change their course slash major once they are enrolled in the university? Are students bound to one course for their undergraduate years? Great question. Um, shall I lead on that one and then you guys can, can add to it? I think um, with this one, there is some flexibility, but there is not kind of flexibility all the way through the course to, to change. And it would depend, um, first of all, on whereabouts you are in the course when you decide to change. And then it would also depend on how related the two courses are. So, for example, if you were studying kind of textile design and you wanted to change to fashion, there would be some overlap there. If you wanted, um, if you were studying photography and you wanted to switch to fashion photography, again, they are related. So there would be kind of more flexibility flexibility there. Um, if you decided kind of halfway through your second year that you wanted to change to a major that was completely unrelated, that would be a, a different a different situation. But there, there is some overlap, so there would be some flexibility, I would say, up until um, maybe the end of the first year, if you didn't want to repeat any part of the course. Yeah, um, I'm just going to put my North American hat on for a second. And um, one question that we often get is the idea of transfer, because that's very common in the US. Like start at a college, go on, you know, start at a community college, go on to 
college, this type of thing. The mobility, it, there's quite a structure, especially um, on the West Coast. We don't have that same vocabulary. We don't have that same structure. Um, but the idea of moving between courses, it is possible. Um, we don't do the same type of credit system. Um, we do a lot of modules and things like this. So if you start going down this rabbit hole, it can get a little overwhelming. But know that every year some students do, have, uh, do make the choice to switch their disciplines and it can be done. But it's one of the things that we strongly recommend is that you try and narrow that down at the beginning of your studies. It just makes life a lot easier. It looks like uh, we have another question. I mean, I think Jessica, you answered that really well. I mean, I think I, my only advice would be like, if you're really not sure, then um, I would definitely recommend doing an art foundation because that's where the foundation year comes in. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go into a major um, unless you're you're pretty pretty clear that that's what you want to do. Um, so that's it's where a specialist study right from the start. Yeah. Exactly. And we can also make a quick pitch for a foundation just as a one year study abroad experience. If students want a gap year, it's a qualification, you get a certificate at the end, you get that dabble in the international experience um, before you make commit to a full degree or return home for your, your degree studies. But it's we get a lot of students who just do it as a one year option, maybe as a gap year. And that's a, we had an American student who studied on our foundation course last year and she's now studying at Parsons. So. Wow, that's cool. I, did, I didn't even know that was an option. Awesome. Um, so as students, again, this is a big difference between US and UK, that structure. Um, we're used to the kind of loosey-goosey changing your major. So that is not typically uh, an option there, but there are some places where there is some flexibility in the beginning. Um, so th those, are, those are really good questions to ask and part of the research that you would want to do if you are pretty um, undecided. But as you can see, like, everyone's really open and they're they're here for you to answer your questions and kind of help you like talk through the different choices so that um you can you can have all the information as you make a, a decision okay we are at 9 36 so we should start to wrap up here with a couple more questions um do you offer minors so no <laughs> uh, generally speaking we don't when there will be some universities, and please, my colleagues, correct me if I'm wrong, that they do something called a dual degree, uh, where they might combine two disciplines. I will tell you, at my university, we don't generally do that. So the discipline that you choose will be what you spend the bulk of your time focused on. Yeah, that, that would be the same with us. There, there's the opportunity to collaborate between courses and to work together on projects. And a lot of that is up to the individual student with the particular projects that they're working on and where their interests lie and who they would like to collaborate across courses. Um, of course, some courses are more related than others. But yes, in general, no, it's, it is your, your course of study that you focus on rather than um, taking any minors. Great. And then our last question. Um, what does student living look like? Um, you want me to take this one to start? Um, so generally um, in the UK, um, I, I don't have any universities where you're required to share a room. So um, standard in the UK is you get your own room. Yay! Um, a lot of uh, universities have spent a lot of money upgrading their accommodation over the last few years. So and a lot of places you can also expect to have um, ensuite accommodation. That's very, very common. Um, some universities do offer um, catered halls, but I think the majority, you tend to share your kitchen. Um, so you, you cook for yourself. I think that's, that's the case at our university. I imagine that's the case. Um, at your so yeah, no meal plans, it is uh, no. self-catering. <laughs> So it does mean you're going to have to learn to cook, but the great thing is that you're going to have another like six people in your halls that are also learning to cook. Um, and you need to find that friend who's really good at cooking because then you're sorted. Um, so that's a really great way for you to make friends. Usually the people you actually share your dorms with in that first year become really, really close friends. Um, so it's normal in the UK to kind of uh, be in a dorm for your first year. And then after that, a lot of people usually will move out into a shared house. Um, so you might live with two or three other people. Um, and that tends to be a bit cheaper 
Um, so usually that's with people that you've made friends with either from your course or from, from your first year in, in dorms. Um, so at our university, we have three different hall options, all of them within walking distance, all of them with single rooms, and the majority of them have ensuite. So I don't know who else wants to speak next, maybe Jessica? The only thing that I might add is um, something that I've seen in the UK that I hadn't seen a lot of uh, back home is this idea of the private accommodation options that are affiliated with the universities. Uh, and so we have our halls of residence that belong to the university and we operate. But in order to expand our capacity, we have negotiated relationships with private halls operators. So we still facilitate that, we still help with the application, but just know that there are different styles of accommodation. Some of these tend to be very nice and therefore have a price tag attached to it that reflects that. I tell you, some of our students are living in nicer halls than my home um, because there's just so many price points right now. Um, so know that the university will facilitate that for you, but there will be different options available. And as well as the, the student kind of residence um, question, then I suppose the other thing to think about as well is the type of city that you want to go to, because in the UK, there's such a wide choice of universities. There's going to be a location that will fit what you're looking for. But um, So Jess and Georgie's universities are based in kind of slightly smaller cities. We're based in, in Leeds, which is a bigger city. So um, it's the third biggest city in the UK, although people from Manchester try to pretend that they are. So really, it's the kind of environment that would, um, would suit you, really. In the UK, there are some universities which are based in more rural settings as well so it really kind of depends way which kind of environment you think would suit you best. I just have to share my favorite fact about towns and cities in England. It is not determined by the size of your community it's determined by historically whether or not you have a cathedral. So Bournemouth is 200,000 people but we're a town because we do not have a cathedral and we haven't applied for city status. So Winchester down the road has 60,000 people that is famous for its cathedral and they are a city. So I just love that. That's one of my favorite things. So don't judge just based on town or city, but look at the numbers. That's a better indicator. That's I thought so it was whether you had a Woolworths department. Yeah. Store. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those fun, like quirky England things. I love that. That's great. Um, and, and, you know, bottom line students, it, it's probably going to still be cheaper than playing room and board at an American university. Um, it, there are some really cool differences. And again, come to our affordability workshop and you'll learn more. And we have another one next week at 2.30 about thriving abroad. We're calling it thriving abroad. And they're going to talk all about kind of how to adjust to um, living in a foreign country and just some of those more practical things. And so um, I'm sure that housing and accommodation is going to come up um, in that workshop as well. All right, any last, last questions? Last chance, last chance. Nope, okay, cool. So um, students, please do reach out to Georgie, Je uh, Jessica, and Jenny. Um, they're here to, to help and answer your questions. Um, thank you so much to the three of you for being with us today. This was really, really informative um, and um, just super exciting to learn about these different options. Um, so I hope everyone has a great day. I'm going to turn off recording thank now. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. All right. Bye everyone, thanks so much.